tonight's presentation, on the second night of the uh, Hamotevin Star Party. We have as our guest speaker tonight, Bob Daya, who's a good friend of Novak and a good friend of AHSP. He's mm -hmm. been here many years, talking on various topics uh, that he picks up expertise on as a, as a journalist and reporter. Uh, he has been at the Girls Guy and Telescope, as most of you know, and now he's primarily book author and uh, some yep. tours yep. and uh, blogging. He's got a good presence on the web. So he's been gracious enough several years to come and talk to us about what's new and interesting and very good presentation time. So we appreciate what's coming up here. So with that, I'll introduce Bob. And okay, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so before I start, I should point out this is definitely one of the more technical and abstruse topics I've ever uh, talked about. I hope some of you didn't like pick up some of the tomatoes and onions at dinner to, to hurl at me if uh, this comes off as crazy stuff. But before I get started, I just wanted to uh, once again thank Novak, uh, who invited me to speak again this year and come to HSB. I really appreciate it. I decided to wear this shirt today. This is from 2006, from, uh, from 10 years ago. I think this is about my fifth or sixth or seventh AHSP. I've kind of lost count. But if you go back 10 years, I've been here most most of the, most of the years I've, I've been here. I've missed a couple star parties, but... I think it's been you know, a pretty large majority of the star parties I've been up here and always have a great time. So I want to thank the club and I want to thank all the people, including uh, you know, uh, Alan here and everybody, Wade, Chris, Catherine, John. I know I'm leaving a lot of people out, but I've worked for an organization, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. We put an annual meeting together every year. Um, and I, and uh, roughly the same size as this event, and so I know how much work goes into it, and it's an awful lot of work. So maybe we could have a quick round of applause for all the Novak people who've helped put this together. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. And uh, I should also mention, too, I forgot, I should mention the Mountain Institute, who do a great job keeping us comfortable and giving us uh, good food, too. So we appreciate their effort. And of course, I also want to thank all of you for coming. And I, it's been a little interesting, and, and some of the Novak members might be able to confirm this. I think I've seen a lot of new faces this year. How many of you are first time HST? Okay, great. Yeah, I, I would say this year, w do you know if, some of, if this has been more new, new people this year than previous years? I've really noticed that. So it's really nice to, to get to meet new people. And so that's been really exciting. Before I get, bef and one more slide before I get going, and this is especially for the first time people here. Uh, this is uh, Phil Wary, who everybody in Novak, he was very dear to Novak and anybody who's been attending this star party. You know, he was one of the leading Novak people who uh, was organizing Almost Heaven's star party. And very tragically, a little over a year ago, he passed away right before the star party last year. And I know I got to meet him and got to know him a bit, and I also got to meet his wife on an Eclipse cruise. Really great guy, and we all, we all miss him a lot. So I, you know, every time I come here, I'm gonna, gonna remember my interactions with Phil. I also wanted to show a quick slide of this gentleman. He was a neuroscientist at the uh, Penn State Hershey Medical Center. And a week ago, Friday, just eight days ago, I met his widow um, at the closing settlement meeting to buy his former house. I knew he had died about a year earlier. I didn't know why. And then the next day when I was moving into my new house near Hershey, Pennsylvania, his neighbor told me that he was diving on the wreck of the Andrea Doria um, off the coast of Massachusetts. And this was July 21st of last year and he never resurfaced and they don't know how or why he died uh, but I'm now the owner of his house as, or his former house and it's a little bit of a weird feeling um, you know kind of feeling like I benefited from his tragedy and especially his his uh, wife's tragedy but I do want to uh, his name's Thomas Dr. Thomas Pritchard my dad also worked at that med, med center so I'm sure my dad knew him um, but you know, he died in the spirit of exploration and adventure, 
which I, I applaud that at least he died doing something that he loved. And uh, I think it's what I'm going to talk about tonight with LIGO is sort of, you know, the same spirit of adventure and exploration, just in a very different arena. So I just wanted to, before I really get started in the talk, remember Phil uh, Wary and Thomas Pritchard, and um, I'll try to have my talk live up to their memory. Uh, so the big event was February 11th of last year. I had advance notice that they were going to announce the discovery of gravitational waves at a press event that was held at MIT and then it was jointly done um, at the National Science Foundation in DC. Uh, so this, you know, basically we saw it over television, but they had MIT scientists there uh, to answer questions. I knew that it was a real discovery. There had been rumors circulating on the internet for months, but a member of the team was a lecturer on this upcoming Sky and Telescope Eclipse Cruise, which I was also one of the lecturers. And r shortly before this date, they, uh, he changed the topic of his, of his talk, the title of his talk, to, I can't remember what it was before, but it was something like, n you know, the new era of gravitational wave astronomy. And based on the abstract, I could tell that yes, the discovery was real. And so I knew going into this press conference that the rumors were in fact true and LIGO had discovered uh, gravitational waves. That gave me time to do interviews and actually write the article for Sky and Telescope's website before the press event. So when I went to the press event, I was just interested in maybe some other, other quotes or little details that I didn't already know. But we were very good. S we, we, uh, even though I, we could have posted this article a week before the announcement, we waited until 10 a.m. Eastern time when the embargo was lifted, and that's when my story went live. So we did everything in an ethical manner. So going into this press conference, I already knew the result. I'd already done interviews with scientists who were willing to talk about it, but I would still say that I've been in science journalism now for 25 years, and I would say along with maybe extrasolar planets and the discovery of the accelerating universe back in the late 90s, this was, is in my top three of the most exciting topics that I have covered. But as I'll explain in the uh, upcoming hour, the most exciting discoveries are still in front of us. Uh, so this story about the discovery of gravitational waves did briefly was the number one story in the news. Like it was number one story on the CNN website. You know, I checked a bunch of other websites and for at least a few hours, it was the number one story in the world, which I think gives you a sense of, of its scientific importance. But also it was, gr you know, nice to see that science for once, you know, something other than a natural disaster like a tornado or a hurricane or an earthquake, that something good, you know, something really interesting in science made a really big splash in the mainstream media. So some of you might be wondering, what in the heck is a gravitational wave? Now it sometimes gets confused with gravity waves. Gravity waves are an atmospheric phenomenon on Earth or other planets with atmospheres. So these are not gravity waves, they are gravitational waves that I'm going to be talking about tonight. And if I slip and say gravity waves and throw some tomatoes at me. Um, so gravitational waves are a prediction made by Albert Einstein from his general theory of relativity. And basically, and I want to just give you a quick primer for some of you who aren't familiar with these terms, is general relativity is basically Einstein's theory of gravity. And the way that, spa that he depicts gravity is that you have, you know, imagine this is like the surface of a trampoline or a rubber sheet, and you put a bowling ball and maybe a baseball to represent the uh, Earth and the moon. They're going to uh, produce indentations in that, in that fabric of the trampoline. Think of the tra trampoline as space-time. And so the moon orbits the Earth because it goes around and around the curvature in the trampoline produced by Earth's gravity. That's how Einstein's picture of gravity works. Now before him, of course, our, you know, before Einstein, the, th the conception of gravity was from Isaac Newton from the uh, 1600s, where here he depicts 
gravity as kind of this invisible force where these, there's this invisible force connecting the earth and the moon and it's that invisible force of gravity where earth that causes the moon to go round and round the earth. So there's two really different ways of depicting uh, gravity. Um, now what's interesting is that if you're sending a spacecraft to a planet, you don't even need relativity to do your calculations. You can get a spacecraft to Pluto accurately using Newtonian equations. What's interesting though is that it, it's a very subtle difference except if you're in the presence of large masses, but the difference is enough that your GPS that's in your car or, or cell phone or whatever would be totally useless without the corrections for general relativity. Now what happens is the satellites that we're, your GPS receiver is communicating with or orbiting several hundred miles above Earth, because they're farther from the center of Earth, they're traveling in space-time that is slightly less curved than us human beings on the ground. We're closer to the center of mass of Earth, so we're in slightly more curved space-time. So I did, uh, I checked a bunch of different websites and then confirmed this with a scientist. Um, the satellites run about 38 microseconds faster every day because they're orbiting farther from the center of Earth. Now this is really interesting. Your navigational fix would break down after only two minutes and errors of roughly six miles per day would accumulate if the satellites on board were not making this correction for general relativity. So in essence, the fact that your GPS works is confirmation that general relativity is a better, uh, better description of gravity than Isaac Newton's gravity from the 1600s. So the papers where Einstein predicted general relativity, uh, he published two papers during World War I uh, he described, does anybody here speak German? Because does anybody want to try to pronounce his Gravitationswellen or something like that? He produced that, which in, in that interpretation is gravitational radiation, which he would predicted would be produced when you have large massive objects that are moving around. It was interesting is that Einstein later doubted that gravitational waves are physically real or could ever be detected by human technology because he was assuming in that era uh, during his lifetime was before the discovery of black holes, before we knew about exploding stars and neutron stars. The universe that was known at that time was, was seen as very quiescent without these catastrophic events and really bizarre objects like black holes. So. Uh, he actually was fairly conservative and had doubts about one of his greatest predictions. But what was interesting is that physicists who then studied his equations and became real, even like knew more about his theory than Einstein did himself, they came to realize by the late 1950s that gravitational waves had to exist if relativity was a correct description of nature. So gravitational waves are, and I think this is a pretty good diagram, are ripples in the fabric of space-time that propagate outward when you have very massive objects moving around rapidly. Now, for example, I'm waving my arm around. That produces gravitational waves, but they are so unbelievably weak that it's like, you know, we would never hope to detect those gravitational waves. The gravitational waves that we can hope to detect come from very massive objects like black holes and neutron stars in orbit around each other, moving very, very fast, close to the speed of light. Those are the kinds of objects that can bruise strong enough gravitational waves so that we can hope to detect them. Now, gravitational waves uh, are unlike electromagnetic waves in a very key way. So electromagnetic waves are like radio, ultraviolet, infrared, you know, uh, gamma rays, x-rays that are a form of light. So electromagnetic waves travel through space. Key difference, 
gravitational waves are not like that. They are actual distortions in the fabric of space-time itself. In other words, they actually change space-time where from electromagnetic waves, space-time is an actor, a medium through which they travel. So as I give this talk, keep that key difference in mind. So here is uh, a nice movie from the LIGO website showing what happens. Dis let me go back and start this over again. Uh, showing how a gravitational wave will stretch and then compress space in the direction perpendicular to the wave's travel. Now what's interesting, here's the similarity, is that gravitational waves, at least according to the theory, travel at the same speed as the speed of light. They travel the speed of light and they also, because they're propagating in all directions, they weaken by the inverse square law. So you double the distance, the, the strength goes down by a factor of four, triple the distance goes down by a factor of nine, et cetera. Um, but unlike electromagnetic waves, gravitational waves are not in any way affected or impeded by interstellar gas or dust. So if you have two black holes colliding, they're gonna send, black, you know, radiate away gravitational waves in all directions. You know, they're eventually gonna make it to Earth and there's nothing in between us and the, and the event that's gonna stop or in any way impede the waves. So it's important to realize they go off in all directions, uh, but gravity is, and I know we don't think of it this way, but it's actually of the four known fundamental forces of nature, gravity is the weakest force of nature. That's why if I had a magnet and some paper clips, I could lift the magnet you know, with just like a $2 magnet that you could buy at Target, I could lift a pile of uh, paper clips up against the gravitational force of the entire planet Earth. That so it tells you right then and there that the electromagnetic force is a much stronger force than gravity. So gravity is a relatively weak force. The waves are falling off in energy as they spread outward from the source. And because we're only gonna f capture at Earth, a tiny, tiny fraction of the wave's energy. This means, and, uh, and Einstein knew this from the very beginning, gravitational waves are gonna be incredibly difficult to detect here on Earth. And I'll just explain just how difficult this is. Uh, here's a movie, and we can be glad that this is not reality. These are gravitational waves showing the wave front passing through Earth, and so the wave fronts will squeeze and, and distort Earth as they pass through, but the amount is only one one thousandth the width of a proton. So don't worry, that's not actually happening to Earth. Another way to think of it is that a gravitational waves from a distant galaxy will stretch and compress the entire Milky Way galaxy. The visible disk, remember, is 100,000 light years across by about the width of a human thumb. So we're measuring an incredibly tiny effect. That tells you right away, this is an immense technical challenge for the engineers and scientists to detect these things. Um, so with LIGO, there are four expected sources of events in the universe that we expect to be happening or that we know are happening that can produce detectable gravitational waves. Uh, the first one are black hole, black hole mergers. The second one is you have a black hole and a neutron, you know, they're in a, I sh let me just step back, they're in a binary system that, and because they're emitting gravitational waves, that carries away orbital energy from the system, so eventually the black holes will spiral together and merge into a bigger black hole. A second type of system is a binary with a black hole and a neutron star. The third type of system is a binary with two neutron stars. We've actually observed these mergers that are known as short gamma ray bursts. They, right before, or right as they merge, they give off this powerful blast of gamma rays that might last just a fraction of a second to maybe one or two seconds. And then fourth is LIGO probably would be able to see uh, a gravitational wave signature from a supernova but it has to occur in our galaxy for the signal to be strong enough to detect it, whereas LIGO, you know, theoretically should be able to see these events even if they occur in very distant galaxies. Now, s I was talking to some people earlier today who pointed out 
in a sense, gravitational waves have already been detected, and, but I would say they've only been indirectly detected. Okay, the compelling indirect evidence came from, uh, was first discovered, uh, first observed when these two physicists, Joseph Taylor, who's at Princeton, and Russell Hulse, who was at uh, the Plasma Physics Lab at Princeton, they discovered in the early 70s a binary system with two neutron stars and over the course of the next couple decades working with a physicist at Carleton College in Minnesota, my mom's alma mater by the way, named Joel Weisberg, they noticed that the orbital period of this binary system was declining. Okay, this is the theoretical prediction from Einstein that if this system is losing orbital energy from gravitational waves, this is the, uh, the change in the orbit. And we're talking about tiny fractions of a second. We'll look at these data points from the radio telescopes. The, the data points fall right on the prediction. So this is extremely compelling indirect evidence that gravitational waves are for real. And for that reason, uh, Taylor and Hulse shared the 1993 Nobel Prize in Physics for this discovery. I think Joel Weisberg should have also shared in the award considering that he's the radio astronomer who actually did most of the observations. Okay, there's actually been several other binary neutron stars that have been discovered since the Taylor and Hulse pulsar the one with the shortest orbital period, you can only observe this from the southern hemisphere, is J0737-3039 with an orbital period of 2.4 hours. The, se the separation of the two pulsars is shrinking by about three-tenths of an inch per day, but you can actually measure that. And you can see once again, the Einstein prediction is the red curve the data points of the prediction, or uh, uh, the data points of the actual radio observations are the black dots. And I would submit that is a really, really, really good match between observation and exper experiment. So the shrinkage perfectly matches Einstein's predictions, and uh, this gave physicists very high level of confidence, and deservedly so, that gravitational waves are real, but once again, this is, these are indirect detections. We're not actually seeing the waveforms. We're just measuring the effect of the gravitational waves, but not actually observing the gravitational waves themselves. Um, so detecting, as I mentioned, it's gonna, detecting gravitational waves is this huge technical challenge. Uh, the prediction is, I've showed you these different types of events that sources in the Milky Way might produce one detectable event every 10,000 to 100,000 years, which means if like you wanna build a detector and you tell Congress, well, it might be 10,000 years before we detect something, I don't think Congress, especially in its current configuration, is likely to give you funding. So you have to build a sensitivity where you're sensing objects, these events occurring in distant galaxies. Um, so when, when we look at doing an experiment, we're looking at detecting something on the order of one one thousandth the width of a proton. That, that's a really, really hard thing to do. Um, so the very first physicist who took up the challenge uh, was at the University of Maryland, I'm sure many of you have heard of him, named Joseph Weber, and started the 1960s, he started to build these aluminum bar detectors and the philosophy, the, his thought process was a gravitational wave comes through the bar, starts to get it ringing almost like a bell, and you put sensors on the bar itself that will detect this ringing and register the gravitational wave. Okay, his idea wor would work in principle, and he deserves, e and he gets the enormous credit from the community for being the first scientist to take up this challenge. The problem was, he kept claiming detections, whereas other physicists who built their own bars weren't seeing anything. And the problem was too, he didn't really understand all the different sources of noise, background noise, that could cause a bar to ring that had nothing to do with gravitational waves. So to the very end of his life, he died in 2002, 
He was claiming detections whereas the rest of the community pretty much ignored him and he kind of at the end it was kind of sad because even though he was highly respected he was seen as a bit of a pariah and the, the, the community basically ignored his claims and this wasn't a case of this genius who's right and everybody else was wrong this was a case where the community was in fact right so I kind of felt bad for him personally though because he felt you know when he before he died that he was being denied the great discovery and Nobel Prize that he thought was his due. One other, a couple other quick biographical notes about Weber, who was a very interesting person. He was a radio officer aboard the USS Lexington, uh, an aircraft carrier that was actually sunk at the Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942. And fortunately, the ship went down very slowly and almost the entire crew was rescued. And then later, he married the astronomer Virginia Trimble. And as far as I could tell, they had a very long and very happy and successful marriage. She, by the way, is still alive. And of course, she's been one of the great astronomers of the last several decades. So there's another way to detect gravitational waves that is definitely a better way to do it. It's, it's a more sensitive way to do it. And that's taking advantage of a technology called laser interferometry and it's a variation of an interferometer that two American physicists, uh, Michelson and Morley, uh, built in the late 1800s. And I'm, I have a movie here. All these movies, by the way, are from the LIGO website. So what you do is you shine a laser and it's going to bounce off these mirrors. And uh, what will happen is a gravitational wave comes through. It changes the path length of the mirror of, to the mirrors by distorting space-time. So these, what you do is you have the, the light beams from the two arms combine here and then go to a detector. Now, if there's no gravitational wave going through, you can set it up so the cre crests and troughs cancel each other out so you get a null signal at the detector. But here, if the path lengths are changing, you see that the crests and troughs line up differently and you get, you get a variate, varying signal at your detector. So this is an ingenious technique that physicists have known for a long time would be a really, really good way to try to detect gravitational waves. So back in the early 70s, uh, a physicist at MIT, who s all three of them, by the way, are still alive, although Ronald Drever uh, has dementia. Uh, Rainier Weiss at MIT wrote a paper um, about how to design a laser interferometer to detect gravitational waves. So eventually he got other scientists interested. It became a joint project of MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. And the key theoretician uh, was Kip Thorne at Caltech. How many of you have seen the movie Interstellar? Okay, great. That was, he was the scientific consultant on that movie. And I found out from reading his book, The Science of Interstellar, the original story was his idea, but it got modified by the screenwriters. But that but it was basically his conception for the movie, and he was the, the key technical advisor for the movie. Well, this team, this MIT Caltech team, and then they got other scientists involved, they persuaded the National Science Foundation in the early 1990s to spend $300 million to build LIGO. This was the biggest monetary investment ever for a single project from the NSF. This is the branch of the US government that funds a lot of uh, science programs, including uh, Green Bank uh, down below us. Uh, this was a huge risk to put so much money into such a difficult and you know, single project that's very difficult and several times LIGO came very close to being canceled. But fortunately, they kept getting the funding they needed and eventually they built two of these observatories. And in case you're wondering, LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. I would have put the W in there for waves and maybe LIGO sounds really funny. So maybe just LIGO is better. So there's two facilities. There's one in Livingston, Louisiana, 
and the other in a very dry area of eastern Washington near Hanford. And here we see the, two, uh, the location of the two observatories. They're 1,865 miles. I gave this talk several times earlier this year in New Zealand, so I had to convert everything to kilometers, which we should do anyway, because that's a better science system for science. This, by the way, if you're interested, some of us, including myself, were at the control room earlier today uh, at Green Bank. Kind of looked in some ways a little bit like this. This is the control room at Hanford, Washington. Uh, let's see, can I get this slide? There we go. Uh, the arms are two and a half miles long. And because of that length, the ends of these arms have to be raised about a meter to account for the curvature of Earth. Uh, the ground was broken in 1994. And under its early initial LIGO phase, they began operations in 2001. But now they've made many ad, uh, advancements and improvements to the observatory. Uh, so uh, those additional costs are oh, around 200 million. Actually, I think the total amount of money spent now is about a billion dollars on LIGO. That's uh, about the cost, for example, of the uh, Curiosity rover currently exploring Mars. Uh, the tunnels, this is inside the tunnel, but inside these tubes where the laser runs, they are evacuated of air and dust to create the purest vacuum ever seen on Earth. Uh, the density of air inside these tubes is a trillionth the density of the atmosphere on Earth at sea level, and the, uh, the evacuated air would be enough to inflate about 2.5 million footballs. Having just lived in New England, I would say <laughs> if you're talking about a New England Patriots football, then you're maybe talking about like 2.8 million footballs or something like that. I had to be careful about giving that joke when I was giving it to clubs up there. Um, and the reason you need to do that is you want the lasers to be traveling in both arms to be traveling at the speed of light, not slightly slower because it's in a different medium. So you have to make these tunnels uh, almost perfect vacuums. Uh, here we see, by the way, the laser. Now, if the laser was in this room shooting, you wouldn't be able to see it because it's in the infrared part of the spectrum, so our eyes can't see it but certainly the mirrors and detectors definitely know that the laser is there. And it's at a length, wavelength of a little longer than a micron. Uh, here's some of the mirrors. They are ultra pure, ultra smooth, synthetic quartz mirrors, super polished to a roughness of about one over two thousandth wave, the size of an atom. How many of you would like to have a mirror polished to that level of precision? <laughs> I know we have a lot of really good mirrors at the star party here. I guarantee we don't have any that are one two thousandth wave. Um, the top layer of the mirrors was co were coated by the Australians with gold for thermo thermal shielding. These are the most uniform and precise mirrors ever made. I actually think for an amateur telescope, they'd be a little bit of overkill. Um, more than 1,000 people work on LIGO from the U.S. and 14 other nations. So this is, no doubt, this is a U.S.-led program, but there has been very significant international participation and help in developing LIGO. In fact, almost any big science project today is international in scope. Um, it has the world's best shock absorber system, because think about it for a minute. You're trying to detect these subtle variations in space-time, you know, affecting the path lengths of the las laser and these two long arms, but you could get the same signal from like earthquakes, rumbling trucks in distant highways, or even, and this surprised me, howling wolves in the distance. So the mirrors are suspended by, and I'm not a technical expert on this, but it's a very sophisticated four-stage system to isolate them from local sources of noise. And of course, you have two detectors, one in Livingston, Louisiana, one in Hanford, Washington. They're you know, 2,000 miles apart. So like things that would affect one observatory would not affect the other one. Uh, so that's another way to double check. The mirrors are actually suspended from ultra pure few silica fibers that are just a few times thicker than a human hair. And I should also point out, these arms, even though the arms are two and a half miles long, 
The effective length is 250 miles because when they shoot a laser, it bounces off each mirror a uh, hundred times before the lasers are the beams are combined and taken to a detector so the arms are effectively 250 miles long uh, so LIGO can detect gravitational waves stretching and compressing the arms of LIGO by an amount of 10 to the 19th meter which is 1 10 thousandth the width of a proton this when, when I saw this this blew my mind that's equivalent to measuring the distance to Proxima Centauri, the nearest star beyond the sun. The one where last week, by the way, they just announced a planet 4.2 light years away, that's 25 trillion miles, to a precision of the width of a human hair. Okay, that is, I mean, that's astounding. So LIGO is now making the most precise measurements of any instrument ever made by humankind. So this initial LIGO that they built and ran until around 2001 <coughs> could detect a neutron star, neutron star merger out to about 100 million light years leading to an event rate, the calculations from astrophysics, of about one event every 10 to 50 years. So here's the good news about the science team. They did not lie to Congress. Okay, maybe we need them running for president. They told the NSF that give us this money, we'll build the observatory, but in the first phase we don't expect to detect anything at all. Okay, they still got their money, but they were honest about it and they did not detect anything but then they got the money to build advanced LIGO to make improvements to the laser, to the isolation, to the software, et cetera, et cetera. And then what that did is it took the volume of space from this little orange circle to this much bigger purple surf, uh, sphere. And that takes the neutron star, neutron star mergers where they could see them out to a calculated one and a half billion light years. So then you would say we should see many more events every year by making it more three times more sensitive. You're sampling a thousand times greater volume of space, bringing in many more galaxies into your field of view. So then this event rate goes from a not very interesting event rate to a very, very interesting event rate where once you do this advanced LIGO, you should start seeing things. And the good news is, oh, for, before I just uh, get to that, this is then the, the uh, phases of what you would expect to see. You would see the final few dozen orbits. This is taking a black hole merger of the two black holes in spiraling before their fatal plunge. Then you get a really big spike at the merger itself when you get the strongest gravitational wave emission. And then you have a black hole that's initially aspherical, but then it quickly, gravity shapes it into a sphere, and that uh, process is called the ring down, where you get this little tail at the end of weaker gravitational wave emission. So prior to LIGO uh, going into this advanced mode, this is what they expected to see. So the big moment came a little less than a year ago, 5.50 and 45 a.m. I was probably sleeping at the time on September 14th, 2015. So it has the name GW15 for the year, 09 September 14 date. So LIGO saw this signal and then seven milliseconds later, Hanford saw this signal. The detected signal in each case lasted a little bit less than half a second and this was only three days after advanced LIGO had begun a test run and only four, and it was four days before it actually began, began its first official science run. And this is an understatement. The team did not expect a signal so soon after they got started, nor did they expect to see this signal of this strength. The signal was actually much stronger than what they were expecting. And there's a reason for that. And here we can see the, the Hanford, and, uh, Hanford and Livingston data, and here they're superimposed on top of each other. The waveforms are almost exactly identical, and they were, al they were essentially identical to the predictions of general relativity. 
Um, the environmental sensors picked up no disturbances in either, f in either state that evolved in frequency like a gravitational wave. <coughs> so they calculated the false alarm rate as you get expect something like this in a false alarm about 1 in 8,400 years. So in their discovery paper uh, published in Physical Review Letters, which is the leading journal of physics, they were claiming a five sigma result, which means the chance of a random error is less than one in 3.5 million. So five sigma is like the gold standard for claiming a discovery. And I should point out that when they released the paper, other physicists got a chance to look at the data. I didn't hear anybody doubting that the detection was real. Um, one of the team spokesmen uh, said, and I think this is a great quote, Gabriela Gonzalez, she goes, this was the first detection of gravitational waves, so there was no room for a mistake. And you have to remember, it took them months before they made the announcement. They checked, rechecked, triple checked, quadruple checked, you know, had different teams do different analysis. They did not want their first claim detection to be a, f to be a false positive. So here we say uh, Einstein in his grave apparently was happy. So it <laughs> took over 100 years for your computers to catch up with my computers. <laughs> However, and I hope I don't get eggs thrown at me for the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> and even people, you know, whether you like Trump or not, I hope people can enjoy that slide. Um, so this is what, if, even though this is in gravitational waves, you can convert this. It's in the same he human hearing range as what we hear with our ears. So you can hear the signal converted into audio waves. Let me go back and you can hear it again. You can hear the rumble and then you can hear, hear that whoop at the end. That's the actual merger. So you can actually convert this and listen to the waves. But you can see the whole thing just lasted a fraction of a second. Uh, pretty amazing. Okay, so based on this data I showed you a minute ago, uh, the waveforms and the amplitude uh, you can do using relativity, that tells you that the black holes, the two black holes, one was 36 plus 5 or minus 4 solar masses, the other one about 29 solar masses before the merger, actually they later, I just saw recently they revised the estimate to 30 and 35 solar masses. So black holes of that mass are about 100 miles across. If the black holes, for example, had been less massive, the amplitude of the waves would have been lower, but the in-spiral and merger would have taken longer. So it's from looking at the characteristics of the waveform that you can start to get the masses um, of the black holes themselves. Uh, what's really interesting here is let's say they're 30 and 35 solar masses. We've never observed black holes of that mass before. All the previously known black holes from stars that we can get the masses because they are in orbit around a normal star and you can measure the orbit and get a mass. Those are all roughly 5 to 20 solar masses. So this mass range of 30 and 35 solar masses was a pretty big surprise because we, didn't, we don't really know of black holes that heavy. So that, that right away was, like when I first heard of the news about this, that immediately jumped out to me. That's really significant. Uh, this is a movie greatly done in slow motion. In real life, they'd be whirling around so fast you couldn't even see them. Uh, but this is a slow-mo computer simulation of this merger of how like the gravity of the black holes are distorting the light coming from the space-time behind them. And you can see they're, they're revolving around the center of gravity. They get closer and closer. Then bingo. And at the end, you can kind of see it wobble a little bit. That's the ring down. Now, by the way, these should be R-rated movies. These are violent movies in reality. Uh, this is another really cool one. There you see the, the um, where the, the, let me go back a minute. Uh, we, the, you know, the, these things are the waves and you can see the waves get really, really strong right before and at the merger. And then you get uh, these ripples at the end from the ring down. And then this is kind of zooming in on this process. So the black holes were orbiting the common center of gravity 
250 times per second, that's half the speed of light, right before the moment of merger. So this is really cool. Here you kind of see it zooming in the black holes themselves and see how the gravitational wave emission gets stronger and stronger right at the time of merger. And there you see the merger and then the ring down of the black hole. So that's really cool. And then here uh, we see uh, a way looking at the, uh, from a relativity point of view, of the indentation of space-time. Now the resulting black hole from the merger contains 62 plus or minus four solar masses. And you might be wondering, well, if it was 30 and 35 equals 65, how do you get 62? I'll, I'll explain that in just a minute. But I like this movie because you really kind of see, using these vectors for space-time, what's really happening from a general relativistic perspective. Now they're getting, f and you can see the time, how this is greatly being compressed so we can see what's happening in detail. In reality, once again, this is happening at half the speed of light. So in reality, it would be so fast we wouldn't even see it. And there's the merger. Okay, so that missing three solar masses were radiated away by the gravitational waves in about one one hundredth of a second. That is exactly the amount predicted by relativity. This is what's really amazing. The peak power output at the moment of collision was 50 times the total radiated energy by all the stars in the entire visible universe at that same moment in time. So e we think of these waves as being weak, but if you were right there at the black hole, right at the source, the gravitational waves would have stretched me, Bob Noya, 12 feet tall, then squeezed me to three feet within a millisecond before stretching me out again. In other words, if you were really, really close to the event, the gravitational waves would kill you. And it is an, an immense amount of energy being released. But once again, you've got the inverse square law, et cetera, et cetera. So when they get to Earth, they're very, very weak. Uh, what's really cool too is that advanced LIGO could have detected this merger to a distance of 6 billion light years. The estimated distance is about 1.3 billion. So the team now expects that binary black hole mergers will be the dominant source that they see in the years to come. The LIGO they expect will now make dozens or even hundreds of these detections per year. Uh, this is the computer simulation of the ring down. Uh, they can tell that the black holes merged into a slightly flattened sphere that settled into an equilibrium. And I, I'm not, I'm, this is a little beyond my technical expertise, but the calculations suggest that the resulting black hole was spinning about two-thirds the maximum theoretical speed for a black hole of that mass. The pr black hole presumably got a little bit of a kick where because the two black holes were not equal in mass, they were probably both spinning, you get a kick, but they couldn't determine that from the, uh, from the data. Uh, with two detectors and the seven millisecond time delay between the detections, they can then triangulate a source to the southern hemisphere, but only to an area of sky of about 600 square degrees. So this, uh, w by the way, one of the LMC is inside this error region. So they can say that the event took place somewhere either in this contour, this banana, or this banana. Based on the amplitude of the waves, they estimate that it was roughly 1.3 billion light years from Earth. Now, as, as amateur astronomers, if I told you to go fishing for a brief fla flash of light, in an area of 600 square degrees, then I would start getting tomatoes and onions hurled at me because that's a lot of sky. There's no way you're going to find anything in 600 square degrees. What's interesting, though, is that NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope was operating and it detected a very weak one second burst of high energy X rays coming from the southern hemisphere, although not well localized. At, at almost the exact same time, and the calculations suggest there's just a 0.2% chance that this was a random coincidence. You get this little X-ray burst and the, the gravitational waves from the black holes at almost the same time, 
but we really, it's hard to know if this is real or not. There's an Italian gamma ray satellite called Agile that didn't see anything, and there's no convincing theoreti theoretical explanation of why two binary black holes merging would give you this kind of signal. So this will never be known. We'll never know if this X-ray burst was associated with the gravitational wave event, but it certainly is a very tantalizing possibility. Then, uh, uh, on uh, June 15th, just a couple months ago, the LIGO team announced a second event called GW151226. In the US, it was picked up on Christmas Day 2015, a pretty good present. Uh, the signal lasted about one second and indicated black holes with about 14 and seven and a half solar masses that merged and produced a 21 solar mass black hole. Uh, this second detection was also consistent with general relativity and was much more in line in terms of the masses of the black holes of what scientists uh, expected. So with more detections of merging black holes, it's really interesting. Where do these black hole binaries come from? Are they pairs of stars that each go supernova and their cores form black holes that eventually merge? Or do you have two stars that are far apart form black holes and eventually the black holes lock onto each other gravitationally and merge inward and, and form a bigger black hole. We don't really know which of these origin mechanisms explain these two systems that have been detected. Uh, the signal for the second event came from the final 27 orbits. In this case, there was about one solar mass converted to gravitational waves. It was somewhere in this error region uh, it was about 1.4 uh, billion uh, light years from Earth. There was actually a third possible event observed last October that was a weaker event. So they're not yet convinced whether it's real or not. They're still in a sensitivity range where catching a merger of two neutron stars is still a long shot. So from this discovery though, this is uh, one of the team members I interviewed, Chad Hanna at Penn State. He's, yeah, this is uh, actually after the second event. He goes, we now have form far more confidence that mergers of two black holes are common in the nearby universe. Really important to know that. And here we have Cole Miller at the University of Maryland who's wearing a Grateful Dead uh, shirt, so I'm assuming he's a deadhead. And he said, you need another one to be completely convinced, and this is it. LIGO is a genuinely new window on the universe our catalog of stellar mass black holes, that's black holes roughly the masses of stars, is going to be overwhelmingly increased by LIGO. So here are the major implications of the LIGO discovery, the immediate implications. Number one, it works. Gravitational waves are for real, meaning scientists have a new way of studying the universe, like Galileo's first peek at the universe through a telescope, we now have a new way of studying black holes and pro prove that they exist that doesn't just depend on black holes accreting gas and dust and sometimes swallowing stars from their surroundings. We now know that stellar mass black hole binary systems exist and the two black holes will merge within the age of the universe. We've now seen two systems where the general relativity makes accurate predictions and much stronger gravitational fields than those previously met measured and was those those 30 and 35 solar mass black holes we now know that these heavier stellar black mass black holes exist however there the this is what's really exciting the long-term implications number one we now have an ability to test general relativity and space-time in extremely strong and fast changing gravitational fields and might point the way discrepancies once you have dozens or hundreds of events if they start seeing discrepancies with the predictions of relativity that'll start pointing the way to physics beyond Einstein including clues that might help eventually merge relativity with quantum theory that would be enormous we now this is this is more in the physics realm in the astronomy realm, we now have an ability to take a census of black holes and neutron stars and other galaxies, especially those in binary systems. 
We can from stellar mass black holes form from massive stars. So by looking at how these merger rates change with a function of distance, that will be a proxy for studying the history of massive star formation over time. My favorite is number four, the possibility of detecting new types of objects and phenomenon that are previously unknown to science. And I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk talking about this, the lesson of history. Every time scientists open a new window on the universe, revolutionary discoveries always ensue. So the way I'll put it is, I can tell you that there will be great discoveries in the years ahead. I can't tell you, however, what those discoveries will be. All I can tell you is that there will be great discoveries. Uh, this is from Nobel laureate John Mather. The LIGO discovery opens a new window into astronomy that we never had. This guy's cool, he's an amateur astronomer, Shane Larson at Northwestern. Gravitational waves allow us to look at the universe, universe not just with light, but with gravity. Uh, John, uh, Mark Kamiokoski at nearby Johns Hopkins. This discovery opens a new window on the vast population of stellar remnants, that's black holes and neutron stars, that we know are out there, but of which we have only seen a tiny fraction. Uh, Vicki Calagera at Northwestern, I love this quote, it's impossible to imagine, and she's a very creative uh, astrophysicist, she says it's impossible to imagine that we have thought of everything in nature that can create gravitational waves. My alma mater is Oberlin College, astrophysicist Rob Owen, who got his PhD under Kip Thorne at Caltech. What ex excites us most is the likelihood that we'll detect phenomena that are completely unexpected, phenomena that were completely invisible from the dawn of humankind until September 2015. So think about this, when we, dis when we opened up the radio window and did radio astronomy, it discovered quasars and pulsars, two of the most energetic and amazing objects in the universe of which we knew nothing prior to radio astronomy. Gamma ray, opening up the gamma ray window led to the discovery of gamma ray bursts, the most powerful explosions in the universe. Uh, the X-ray window led to the discovery of accreting black holes like, ex like Cygnus X1 depicted in this artwork. Infrared astronomy opened up the discovery of disks, planet forming disks around other stars among many other things. So what's happening right now with LIGO is we're witnessing the birth of a new science. So scientists are just getting started. We only have two really good detections, but the real excitement isn't those two detections. The excitement is still to come. Advanced LIGO, uh, they shut it down in January of this year. It's about to resume in just about a month or so at a higher sensitivity, so the event rate's gonna go up. So at this time next year, if you want me to give this talk next year, we might have 10, 20, 30, 40 detections a year from now. Uh, uh, by 2019, advanced LIGO will be two and a half times more sensitive than it was this past year. Then we have other gravitational wave detectors coming online. There were no other ones operating other than the two LIGO. There's one in Italy that's about to uh, go to a higher sensitivity in just a month or so called Virgo, one under construction in Japan called Kagra, and LIGO India just got funding from the Indian government. This is the one in Italy uh, that's been operational, but then they shut it down for a couple years to do the same types of uh, upgrades that they made to LIGO. But Virgo is now going to be in a range where it should start detecting the same signals that the two LIGO facilities detect. And by having three detectors, you then get to a much smaller area of sky to look for electromagnetic counterparts. Once we get the one in India and Japan up and running, then we're talking a few square degrees where we can look for other counterparts. That's gonna be incredibly exciting, and that's when amateur astronomers will be able to get involved in this. 
Um, and some of us who were at Green Bank, they talked a little bit about this today. Green Bank, at the moment, there is a net worldwide network of radio telescopes, including Green Bank, that's timing pulsars in different directions from Earth, you know, timing the, the radio pulses of these pulsars. And if you have a very long wavelength gravitational wave passing through the inner solar system, that'll slightly change the timing and we'll be able to infer the detection of gravitational waves. I would expect in the next five years, we will have a detection from this method. You can also detect gravitational waves from the inflationary epoch of the early universe when the universe went through this superluminal expansion right after the Big Bang. There was actually a claim detection of this a year ago in the polarization of the microwave background. Then they realized they hadn't adequately accounted for foreground dust in the Milky Way. But eventually, I would expect we will see this signal from the inflationary epoch and that'll be of monumental importance in cosmology. Uh, eventually, the European Space Agency would like to launch a laser interferometer in space called LISA for laser interferometer space antenna that'll detect very low frequency gravitational waves for merging supermassive black holes and many other sources. There's going to be three spacecraft in a triangular formation separated by about three million miles. Originally, NASA was a partner in this but had to pull out because of lack of funding. This, unfortunately, though, is many years away from launch. Uh, this is the computer simulation done at NASA Goddard of the gravitational wave emission from two mass supermassive black holes. And then earlier, uh, a la late uh, last year, ESA launched a Pathfinder mission to test technology and the, te the technology uh, demonstration mission has been very, very successful. This is a, a kind of a schematic technical diagram of the two spacecraft. So there are two test masses, these cubes inside each spacecraft, two kilogram gold platinum cubes that are 15 inches apart and they're surrounded by a spacecraft that shields them from all external influence. So they're moving under the effect of all of just gravity alone. A laser interferometer on board measured the separation to a precision less than the width of an atom, which was five times better precision than expected, and proved that you can get these test masses that will only be influenced by gravity and not by the solar wind or anything else. So it's kind of a technology demonstration mission that proves that this LISA mission could work. So to conclude, I want to go back to Kip Thorne. Uh, great quote that he came out with at the press conference announcing the first detection. He said, until now, we scientists have only seen warp space time when it's calm. It's as though we had only seen the ocean surface on a calm day, but had never seen it roiled in a storm with crashing waves. The black holes that LIGO observed created a storm in which the flow of time speeded, then slowed, then speeded. A storm was, spent, was space bending this way, then that. As I said, though, as great as that was, the best is still to come. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, what's the weather like out there? Is it clearing up or? I wanted to make sure I finished. Is it? Okay. So we have lots of time. Okay, yes, over here. I was just wondering, um, do you, can you explain a little bit why Einstein thought gravity waves traveled at the speed of light and whether there's experiments planned to try to confirm that? Okay, that's, that's a great question. And the reason is just, um, you know, and this is something that's a little beyond my technical expertise, but it comes right out of his equations that, these, that this ripple would propagate out at the speed of light. Um, the way we'll be able to, de to test it, if we start seeing electromagnetic counterparts, the signal from the electromagnetic wave should arrive at the same time as the gravitational wave. So not so much from one or two events, if we start getting dozens of events where we see some kind of x-ray or visible light radio signal 
if we see some kind of change or delay in one over the other, then that would be very, very significant. And once again, once we can triangulate these sources to a few square degrees, okay, then people in this room are going to be interested in hunting for a source. There could be, there's, there's gamma ray bursts with afterglows that are easily detectable with amateur equipment. Amateurs have detected dozens and dozens and dozens of gamma ray burst afterglows. So I would think that some of these LIGO or these gravitational wave events are absolutely going to have electromagnetic counterparts, including an optical light that amateurs can detect. So I think this is going to be a field once they get more of these detectors up and running. The amateurs are ready right now to do it. The problem right now is the isn't the amateurs, it's getting enough these other countries getting their detectors online and that'll be able to test that prediction and if it turns out the gravitational waves arrive a little earlier or s later than what they expect that will be a monumental discovery the expectation is they get here at the same time but we'll see we'll find out they're, they're, that's testable yes over here the following on that the christmas day signal was that um were there any no not that I know of, not that, and believe me, once these detections are announced, the, these, the people who operate these, you know, the scientists on these, these high energy satellites like SWIFT and uh, Fermi and Agile, they then pour through their data to look to see if they see anything that might have been correlated. Now the problem with that first one I mentioned is that neither source is well localized enough that you can real, like you could say, okay, there's a very low probability that they were unrelated based on the temporal coincidence, but neither source is anywhere near localized enough that they really can make any kind of strong claim. But believe me, that immediately, that announcement set the theorists in motion trying to explain how two merging black holes of that mass could give you an X-ray flash. So it got the theorists going. Yes, over here. Okay, let me go back to that. That's, that was really, uh, let me just, let's see, hold on. Um, so what happens is, let me go back to the second one is the better, better one. Oh, I skipped right by it. Is it this one right here? That it? Yeah, so what happens is, so you have these, this, in this case it's neutron stars. So you have two neutron stars that are in orbit around each other. But, and when they're far apart, when you, you know, these things are like, I think they're about, you know, um, trying to remember the, the distance. They're like several times the distance between the Earth and the Moon apart. Um, but that's close enough that they're emitting gravitational waves way below LIGO's th threshold sensitivity but enough that it causes, you're losing energy from the orbit. Like what happens is, is the gravitational waves are robbing orbital momentum from the two neutron stars. And what that does is it causes them on each orbit, they come a little closer together. And, but as, they, as uh, they get closer and closer, then the, or the, the strength of that effect gets stronger and stronger until at the very end, it rapidly drives a collision. So, but what it is, is if you take black two pulsars, you know, about 1.5 solar masses and put them at this distance apart, general relativity predicts that the orbital period will shrink by about a third of an inch uh, per day. And that's exactly, you can see in this chart, by timing the radio signals from the two pulsars, you can actually measure the orbit to extraordinarily high precision because pulsars are such precise clocks. So this is like a beautiful, this is like a dream experiment that nature has set up for us. I mean, like it can't get much better than this where nature set up these clocks, pulsars, that are so regular in their beating that you can then use them to time incredibly tiny effects. Another example is the first extrasolar planets were found around a pulsar because the timing of the pulsar is so precise that if you see tiny little perturbations in the arrival times of the pulses, 
you can then infer planets. One of those three planets in orbit around that pulsar, this was announced in 1991 or 92, one of those three planets is less than the mass of the moon. So think about that. We, they discovered a sub-moon mass planet and they were able to do it because the pulsar timing is so precise. And the reason there's no doubt anybody who says those planets aren't real is wrong because not only could you determine the first order effects of the three planets, one is three Earth masses, one is four Earth masses, and one is less than the mass of the moon, they actually could detect the, uh, over a no many orbits the effects of the planets interacting with each other and then that affects the pulsar timing. So there is abs there's actually no conceivable other explanation for those pulsar planets. They have to be planets of very specific mass. There's no other explanation. But the, so the pulsar timing is so precise that you can take this tiny little effect, you know, and these pulsars are, I think they're like thousands of light years away, and you can measure, you can measure the orbit shrinking by a th point 0.3 inches a day. Nature is very kind. <laughs> yes, over here. I think inter angular momentum is conserved. It's right. Energy, energy that's being radiated. Yep. And uh, without talking about general relativity, I think you can have intuition for this mm. curve just on, you know, Earth and the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, as gravitation, as tidal energy lobs tides, yep. lobs energy from the orbit. The, the, uh, when, when things are in orbit, if there's the lower energy mm -hmm. state is closer together and it rotates faster, mm -hmm. and that's, that's just... Right, well in the case of the moon though, the moon's actually spiraling away from the Earth by about an uh, inch and a half a year. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because what happens is it's because of the way the Earth rotates, the tidal bulge pushes the Earth out. Yeah. Yeah, the moon's actually moving away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where energy is getting lost by the rotating system. Yeah. And well, the air? system speeds up yeah. and gets closer together. Right, so the moon is getting farther away because that process steals away rotation yeah. of energy from, from the Earth. Yeah. The Earth is slowing down its rotation. And all that energy, all that yeah. energy is going to the moon. The moon's yeah. getting further away. But in this case. That's a wrong example. Yeah, but no, your general point's right, though. Yeah. I think you might have been asked about why the shape of this curve. Yep. Uh, and the, the intuition doesn't necessarily depend on yep. the details of general yep. yep. relativity. Is what I'm trying to say. One, one thing I should mention, too, you have to remember this is in seconds. So, like, you could do the axis a different way to make this curve look like almost a flat line. It's, you know, there, it's a tiny effect. So, it makes the curve makes it look like a much faster drop in the orbital, you know, uh, no, in the uh, orbital period than, is, than it really is. It's actually a very, very tiny effect. Uh, but you can see how well the data, like how many times in science do you get this good a fit from data to theory? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yep, it does accelerate. The, yeah, now if we could see this in the final year before merger, this curve would be a yeah, straight line down. It's, so it's, it's uh, you know, we're still seeing this 85 million years before they collide. So, you know, I won't be alive when these two neutron stars collide. But it is inevitable. These two black holes, according to relativity, they will collide 85 million, or two neutron stars, they will collide 85 million years from now. So here's the thing, we've observed neutron stars collide with these short gamma ray bursts. So we know eventually LIGO is gonna see some of these events. And when it sees it coincidentally with the, gamma, with the ga short gamma ray burst, that'll be really, really exciting because that'll probably confirm the models that say that these short gamma ray bursts come from colliding neutron stars. But because we see systems like this and the previous one that Taylor and Hulse studied, um, we can be very confident that, you know, that there are binary neutron stars that are eventually going to merge. Yes, over here. Uh, it's interesting to point out that the mickelson morley uh, interferometer mm. experiments, they repeated that several times, mm. improving the sensitivity each time. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. But that set up uh, the requirement. I mean, someday somebody had to do something like theory of mm-hmm. relativity. Yep. It's interesting the same technology uh, drove special mm-hmm. relativity and, and is here so involved in general relativity. Yep, that's right. Let's see, any others in the back here? Yeah, so you mentioned uh, the ability to detect one to ten thousandth of a diameter of a proton. Uh, at, at, you know, at the wavelength of laser light, that's a pretty small fraction of the wavelength. So yeah. The, the ability to detect the phase angle difference between the two waveforms must be like fractions of the right. degree. You know what I, that I, is? Yeah, I don't. That, that you'd, I would be a LIGO team member, but you're right. It's It's... An incre- it's incredibly tiny, tiny effect. Yes, back here. Yeah. So, um, so I just wanted to share something that was really cool about this. So um, they made this announcement on February 11th mm-hmm. um, in Washington, D.C. at the NSF yep. headquarters. The next day at the Air and Space Museum downtown where I work, one of the guys from LIGO showed up at the museum. Oh, great. And I happened to be running our gravitational lensing mm-hmm. demonstration on the rubber sheet mm-hmm. and the wave and the marble mm-hmm. show that he was space time. So he strolls up and I start telling him about it. He's like, oh, <laughs> One of the things that he told me, um, so his job, he worked on the Hanford Washington detector, and he's one of the environmental impact techs. Mm-hmm. So he was bathing the detector in fake earthquakes. Yeah, that's right. Strikes, fake radio things to see how it would react so mm-hmm. that he could account for whether, these, whether a detection was real or whether it was something that was happening on Earth. He wrote part of the paper mm-hmm. that said, no, guys, whether this is legit. Mm-hmm. The night that this detection happened, Wow. Oh, man. <laughs> One thing, too, you mentioned gravitational lensing. That is another brilliant predicti- prediction of relativity. And Einstein said during his lifetime that he thought it was a real phenomenon in nature, but he said, oh, humans will never be able to detect it. Well, we now detect it all the time. Amateurs have detected micro lensing events gravitational microlensing from planets around other stars. So even amateur astronomers now are detecting microlensing, and Einstein was, ver- was you know, he, he was very imaginative, obviously, but he did have, his imagination was somewhat limited in predicting the future of what we could do with our technology. So like within less than 100 years of relativity, we were detecting microlensing and a hun- and I you know great coincidence a hundred years after his paper on relativity LIGO detects gravitational waves so it kind of was like a beautiful hundredth anniversary present for relativity but we detected lensing gravitational lensing like 20 years ago yeah so he was w- he was definitely underestimated the ingenuity um, of s- you know f- scientists and engineers to build these incredibly precision instruments. I might just say he was a great theoretical physicist, yep. but not an engineer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And you need both. You, you need you, you know you need scientists, but you also need engineers to make scientists' dreams come true. Except in a few cases like this, where nature does your job for you. I mean, once again, this is a natural laboratory that would be like it's a dream, you know, like a dream lab. And this, you know, this other system. This is a much better system, and I should point out that a few years ago when I was editor of Sky and Telescope, we had this guy, Michael Kramer, wrote an article about this system. It wasn't just gravitational waves. There are five specific predictions from general relativity that you don't get in Newtonian physics where general relativity makes predictions about this binary pulsar system and as of the time he wrote the article, and this was about three or four years ago, all five of these predictions had been perfectly confirmed by the observations. Like, there were, like there's frame dragging, the, uh, what's that called, the precession. I'm trying to think of the other effects. I can't remember them off the top of my head. But there were five specific GR effects from this system that you can measure and all five are, th- th- as of a couple years ago, the measurements were perfectly in accordance with general relativity. So if there are deviations from general relativity, which there should be eventually, 
it's only going to be in these most extreme circumstances like merging black holes and especially if we can ever observe with LISA the merging supermassive black holes. Take two one billion solar massive black holes merging. If there's ever going to be deviations from general relativity that's where you're going to really see these deviations. Like that, that's why this LISA is such you know, I so badly want to see that built and launched because it's going to be an incredible ability to test general relativity in the most extreme gravitational fields that the universe has to offer, those around supermassive black holes, a billion or even greater solar masses. Yeah, just come on up. Yep. Oh. Mm, yep. Yep. Uh oh. Okay. David Blair from the University of Western Australia. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna have to get that and I can add that to next time I'll get a picture of him. Okay, yeah, love come on up and give me that quote then. That's what we did, that's true. Well thank you. Yeah, that's a great quote. Okay, thank you. Thank you.